Hey everybody, so today we have a special guest coming on the channel that is a fellow LinkedIn learning instructor, and that's actually where we met. And this, this individual is very uh, keen on AI and technology strategy and some of the pitfalls, some of the things to watch out for. So this is one you don't wanna miss if you are in a leadership capacity, in a strategy capacity, and you are doing anything with AI. So also don't forget to see a link down below because I am doing a video with her on her channel because she has a YouTube as well. So make sure you go and check that out. I will also have it linked at the end of this video once it's up. Uh, and if you don't wanna wait until the end of the video, it's linked down below. All right, so without further ado, Let's go get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Rashi Moga. I'm a business strategist, have been a technology leader for over 25 years of my life and on the cutting edge of technology like cloud and AI now. So I'm excited to be here with you, Ashley, today and talking about some of this stuff. All right. Well, thank you for joining. I'm so excited. Um, I think that we should at least say how we, we found each other. We met while... Well, uh, in in hair and beauty at the uh, LinkedIn filming studio, <laughs> and we started I know chatting. You hair and beauty. <laughs> well, for those that don't know, there's going to be a behind the scenes uh, filming of this. If you don't know, we both have LinkedIn learning courses. This is not a promotional video, by the way, but just saying that is how we met each other, and uh, we had a great time chit chatting and. You know, Rishim, I would love to understand from your perspective, the world of AI is such a mess right now. <laughs> like, everybody seems to either be trying to figure out how to pay for the AI they already have, try to start the AI that they don't have, or trying to figure out how to set up their business for success, either by cleaning their data or setting up, you know, relationships and, and that sort of thing. So to start this conversation, why don't you let me know, like, what are some of those um, hurdles and, and things that you know from, from your experience that people are really struggling with in this space? That's such an interesting question, Ashley, because, um, you know, something that I do in a part of my life is also advise a lot of startups and organizations in terms of the go-to-market motions, product mm -hmm. market fit. And oftentimes I hear from business leaders saying, AI is hot, we need to get into the space. <laughs> and how do we build something around AI? And for me, that's a red flag because you should really not be thinking about how you should build something around AI. You should be thinking about what is the problem that my customers have right now? Yep. What are the technologies that I need to solve that problem? And is AI part of that tech stack or not? Can it be a part of that tech st stack yeah. or not? And that's where my conversations start with, yeah. right? My, um, I have this bad cop role, if you will, <laughs> to take them back to the drawing board and say, what is it? that you are trying to solve for? Yeah. What is the real life problem that you're solving for? Yeah, That's the biggest concern right now. Everybody thinks 100%. that they need to have AI as part of their organizational initiative, as part mm -hmm. of their value prop. And that's the only way they're going to get money from investors mm -hmm. or to get attention of their customers, which is not true. Yeah, Essentially, if your business does not solve a critical problem for a customer, a customer doesn't care whether it's AI that you're using mm -hmm. in the back end or you're using Excel sheets in the back end, <laughs> right? And, um, yeah. and that's the most important piece. The other piece that people usually struggle with is just understanding how to get started with AI, Yeah. right? There's a lot of conflict internally within organizations <laughs> as organizations start thinking about embarking on the AI journey um, from people, right? Yeah. How is it going to change our work? Mm -hmm. Is it going to take away our jobs, right? Mm -hmm. What does the future of our success look like in an organization? Mm -hmm. And when organizations do not do that groundwork of educating and bringing people along and making it a part of the conversation in the culture of the organization, yeah. that's when you start seeing those gaps emerging very quickly. Yeah, and you know, like dock workers going on strike. 
<laughs> yeah, yes, it's not. <laughs> not I, not, I not remember. Nice <laughs> so AI, actually, as you and I both know, it's not a new concept. It has been yeah. there since 1960s, right? Yeah. It's only with the evolution of technology, cloud computing, yeah. greater processing power that has yeah. come in, that this this technology is now able to impact and bring yeah. a bigger, bigger impact in the corporate world. Yeah. So I'm surprised <laughs> that organizations and you know leaders are not doing enough in terms of bringing people along as they think about using this technology to solve real life problems. Yeah, and there's a few few concepts in there that I think are are good to touch on. So the first thing, I so agree. Uh, it is a solution looking for a problem. Oftentimes, uh, when you're like, let's use AI, where can we use it? It's like, yeah. wait a minute, that's <laughs> that's not usually how this works. Um, and, you know, you get into a lot of problems with that. So a great example is like, I don't know, query, query parsing. Let's just use that as an example. Everybody has some kind of search problem. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone is trying to then use AI for this, but in reality, BERT models are way less expensive and just as effective. But, you know, that's where over-architecting, over-complicating things sometimes shows up. But I think it ties into the second point you were making, which is if you're not thinking about your culture and the actual problems, you're going to turn around, let's say you're the CTO and you turn around and you tell your staff, hey, we're going down into AI. And they say, wait, why? What are we solving with that? And you say, because we need to be sexy. We need to, because it's the cool thing to do. You all need it's to get the cool thing to do. Right? And it's like, well, wait a minute. I, myself, you know, hypothetically speaking here, um, don't understand where our company is going with AI. How am I supposed to help solve for issues that you haven't explored, CTO person, um, with us as the doers of the work? And so you will immediately start to get pushback. You will immediately get folks saying, well, wait a minute, maybe they're not telling us because they're trying to replace us, right? So it's like, it almost creates this sense of um, secretiveness uh, and hidden agendas and things. So I think these things go hand in hand. If you start with a real problem and you say, you know what, um, real, real scenario here. Um, I just recently, and this is not promotional, <laughs> I just recently started using, um, there's some AI features that monday.com just released. And I use yeah. that for like some general um, back and forth communication with like PMs and stuff. Um, but we, what we were seeing is there was a lot of um, email back and forth that we were capturing through Monday that was a lot of blocks of text. So, hey, I can use an AI feature to summarize what that text is talking about. And it makes my life so much more efficient and easier and we get our stuff done faster. That's a real problem that AI can help solve. But if we were like, well, wait a minute, we need a whole AI orchestration layer where the email comes in and the AI picks it up and does this and tagging and this, and it's like, whoa, do we actually need all that or not, right? And and if we didn't have a clear problem that we were trying to solve that we 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 didn't already have good solutions for, right? Like that that's the other problem. If somebody already came up with a great solution for something and it's effective and it's still cost cost efficient, it's it's a good enough, right? And and that's where yeah, you can add AI to it, but you have to remember there's an additional cost to it an opportunity yeah and here i want to bring this up because this is such an important topic that embarking on a new technology doesn't always mean that it's going to be better cost efficient or um or is going to solve our problems sometimes the problems lie in processes and how we have defined those or the bad data (laughs) Yeah, sometimes it lies in how our data is not communicating with yeah. uh, with different data sets. Sometimes it's more of an issue of how you have carved out the solution. Yeah. So actually, um, and not promoting over here, but um, my Gen AI strategy course on LinkedIn Learning actually talks about these aspects. Mm-hmm. Because oftentimes there is this tendency that there is this new shiny new technology <laughs> That's going to solve all our problems. Shiny thing syndrome. <laughs> right? And that's not always true. It's so so many times, and I can guarantee you, instead of saying so many times, I should actually say 100% of the times, it's mm-hmm. not about the technology that you use, 
yeah. but it's about how your processes are laid out what yeah. you're trying to solve for how you have trained your people all those things combined that solve the real problem as opposed to just yeah. the technology technology yeah. is an enabler but don't lead with technology lead yeah. with what you're trying to solve for yeah i mean i will say there are some instances where leading with the technology i'm not saying that should be the only thing but a good example is if you work in a uh, industry or a company that has a lot of legacy systems and a lot of legacy thinking and you know there is a, a stakeholder that is now championing the use and experimentation to understand how ai can maybe improve some of those processes maybe you do lead with that with your developers because then they get them it gets them excited it's like oh finally a new technology thank goodness we can do something with that you know i so i can see some cases but i think they're um they're, they're in the minority compared to like yeah you, you shouldn't lead and with the technology still the core core goal over there is not to just implement the technology for the sake of implementing it the mm. core goal is still how to make everybody's life better how yes. to solve a problem yes. and then technology is an enabler obviously technologists are going to get excited about the yes. new technology they want to embark yeah. on that they want to test it out at least yeah. they want to be early adopters and that's all fine as long as the core remains yeah that you're trying to solve for something as opposed to just use a technology for the sake of using it Yeah and you mentioned earlier you know some folks are getting into AI just to satisfy satisfy board members and uh you know stakeholders that that think that that's the thing that they need to do but you know what if you go in with a good business case to solve a problem your stakeholders are going to be very excited that you're cutting cost by this much or speeding this thing up by that much whether you use ai or not so you know there is so much hype out there that i think a lot of stakeholders think oh if we don't get into ai we're going to be left behind but i think that's where leadership needs to help with that narrative to say yeah. you know what we are choosing not to go into ai for this reason and that's a strong statement to make and you got to have data to back that up that basically <laughs> tells the investors and tells everybody else that you really know what your what is the issue that you're trying to solve for and whether um a technology fits in your tech stack to do that or not now it's ne- it's when you say we are not using ai you're saying you, we are not using ai yet because there's so many use cases actually that we haven't even explored we are st- still mm-hmm. Well, but then there's some that are just not AI use cases, right? Yeah. I think that there's a, a great article that came out today, and I I'll link it down below because I can't remember who wrote it, but it of course is a very enticing title, which is when AI is not the solution. And you know, I, I'm an, a knowledge graph person, as as everyone on this channel knows. Um, you know, AI and knowledge graph have a lot of overlap and a lot of things in common, but. you know it's the same with knowledge graph knowledge graph is not always a solution you know like it's the best tool for the job if mm-hmm. ai is a good tool for the job then great if not then don't use it <laughs> yeah don't there's no need to and but this this perception that startup founders have mm-hmm. or business leaders have has some ground to it has some base to it 5 years ago when technologies like web3 technologies ml big data mm-hmm. uh, blockchain they were hot and there was enough money that was coming in mm-hmm. uh, from various places economy was in a different um, different place at that time there was a lot of money that was going in just because people were stuffing their value prop with these <laughs> keywords if you will yeah. right hot shiny objects today we are in a different scenario because yeah. everybody is more pragmatic around it everybody wants to spend money wisely and where yeah. they'll get returns and that's why everybody now questions how you are solving a problem as yeah. opposed to which technology is yeah. your well and that that's another question i want to ask you because i think that that's one of the big struggles so let's say the two topics that we've we've gone over are covered the the, the organization knows they're using ai for the right use case and they understand this is the problem they're trying to solve with it but they don't have the resources and there's two pieces to that right there's either you just don't have the staff that is trained up in it and there's a whole slew of things to worry about with that 
and strategies around that. But then there's also, and this is the, the part I would, you're very curious on your take, is how do you create a, like, let's say a product roadmap strategy that you already had a roadmap probably this year and for two years out, right? How do you fit in AI or is it fitting in? Like, how do you think about that? How do you get people involved in this decision-making? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are two aspects to it. One is internal focused, which is, this is my product roadmap. Can AI come into pieces and mm -hmm. help with rapid development? Mm -hmm. And when I say rapid development, can I use a no-code, low-code solution, for example, for development of some of those features? Can I start looking at testing differently? And can mm -hmm. I bring in um, AI-powered testing solutions for rapid development? Mm -hmm. Can I look at DevOps differently now? So those are the pieces where you can think about how AI can still blend in and help you achieve that rapid development. Mm -hmm. That's internal facing. Mm -hmm. External facing is when you really want to go out and tell your customers that it's an AI powered solution, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when you start thinking about how do I make a difference? Is there an ability to bring in a NLP, more robust NLP powered, say, chatbot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, that helps with customer success, that helps with uh, customer support. Then you start thinking about those pieces. So it's about not scratching what you had mm -hmm. on your roadmap, mm -hmm. but seeing what pieces in your roadmap can can basically um, leverage some of these AI technologies mm -hmm. for rapid development, for rapid launch, for better. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, Ashley, if you look at it, organizations care about three things. They report on three things to Wall Street. They report on revenue. Mm -hmm. They report on customer uh, you know, satisfaction or NPS, as we would call. Mm -hmm. And third is more around now becoming a hot topic, which is about um, sustainable business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But primarily, Wall Street is only concerned about the revenue that you are bringing in. However, you are bringing in the other two things become important for stakeholders mm -hmm. and shareholders. Mm -hmm. And that's what. So if your AI solution is not helping with any of these three things, then you should pause and say, I'm just not making a difference that I need to make with this AI technology. And maybe this is not the right fit right now. Mm -hmm. How many companies do you think are doing that? <laughs> it seems like everybody's coming out with something with AI. It, it's going to change. I think in next six to eight months, a lot of it is going to change because what companies have not explored yet, they've jumped on the bandwagon, right? But we're still learning so much about responsible AI. We have yeah. not yet figured out the cybersecurity aspects, especially with generative AI, because those threats are very different from cybersecurity threats for AI, yeah. Yeah. right? Generative AI, once you start generating some of this stuff, right, um, your concerns are completely different now. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't yet um, dived into the ethical and the... Yeah. And the social aspects, right? Yeah. We yeah. still leave apart everything else. We still don't have robust data sets that are bias free, right? Yeah. Or have reduced bias. People like you and me, Ashley, don't even even feature um, equally in those data sets, if you will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and you know the other thing because I, you know, come from a research and publishing kind of space um, in my, mm -hmm. my background and my past, you know, there's how the AI is actually trained. There's so many things outside of just ethical, just biases, all of those other things that are, are those are still trying to get figured out. And, and what are the, you know, guardrails and how do you check for these things? And, you know, what are the different measures and can we make those international measures so people understand, you know, what they're getting into when they get into any of the models. But a lot of these companies that train AI, you know, they're just scraping everything they possibly can off the web. And then also, you know, licensing and brokering deals and things with, with folks to get other content, you know, like you'll see like news is a good example where, you know, the news is is now getting uh, sent to some of these AI companies to to feed into the models, but you know there's such little understanding from the general population. 
that's interacting with all these AI tools, what that content is being used for. Your prompt into an AI is used for training. Do you know what that's doing? Do you know, do, are you aware of that? Probably not. And when we talk about this, this tool powered by AI, you're kind of hoping and praying and, 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 you know, giving well wishes that that AI, that whatever company it is, they say this thing is, is powered by AI. Which AI? Yeah. Where is that data going? Do you, company X, have the proper procedures and guardrails in place? As an end user, I don't know. But that's the problem is there's so much that's still being figured out. Every company is still trying to, and I think for the most part, most companies are trying to do good. Like they're not trying to be nefarious. They're not trying to like, you know, do bad things with their AI. They're not trying to do things inappropriately. But the fact is this stuff is at such a scale that it's, it's very difficult to figure out what is actually going in, what's going out. Do you have the right procedures? Do you have the right licensing? Like whatever it is. And it's like, wow, like that's going to, that's going to change a lot of what pe people are doing because some of these models, you know, like the New York Times uh, lawsuit that's going on right now with OpenAI, depending on how that goes, some of the AI companies, if there's legalities that come out of that, will have to potentially rip stuff out or completely retrain models to comply with what happens. I think we are all no. at various stages of we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. Right? Organizations, um, institutions, uh, uh, academic and research uh, organizations, and then individuals. Mm -hmm. We really don't know. But one mm -hmm. thing that I want to put out there, since you brought it up, Ashley, is anytime you are experimenting, anytime you're signing up for something free, mm -hmm. please know that nothing is free. Yes. You are giving, mm -hmm. you're exchanging your information. Yep. Even the chat prompts that you put in in chat GPT, they are being used in the back end yep. to train models. Yep. That data is being used. Data sets are, data is being collected at all times. Mm -hmm. And many times the tools that you think are going to be available to you for free are going to be the tools that are going to harness your data. Mm -hmm. So be sure where you are signing up, how you are signing up, if possible, read their policies Mm -hmm. Every organization, as Ashley, you rightly mentioned, they're trying to be good and do good, right? So they'll have some sort of transparency statement mm -hmm. that's going to be out there. It's all about seeing whether that transparent, transparency statement that they have matches your idea of transparency. <laughs> and well, yeah. You know, some people might be okay. Like I am at that stage right now where women of color there's little representation in any of these data sets. So if if I truly believe in the cause of an organization, I'm willing to provide my data mm -hmm. because I want more representation of women of color in those data sets. Mm -hmm. You might be in a different stage in your career, uh, in your life and in your mm -hmm. career where you're not sure what kind of data you want to be exposed to these data sets. So make yeah. be aware of that and make those decisions based on what your preferences are. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's the other piece of strategy is, um, you know, handling all of these. I know there's been um, some AI that's been released and then pulled back and other AI that, you know, it was put out for free and then people put um, price tags on it after the fact. And they were transparent about that. But, you know, that that was what happened. And it's it's getting to that point where it's like, you know, when you're creating the strategy, you have to build in that um, that accordion, right? Like to shrink it or grow it or whatever you need to do with it because it is such a new thing. You don't know who's willing to pay for it. You don't know what information people are willing to share or if you should allow them to share. Like maybe it is just like red hot pokers do not touch that information because it's too risky for you as a business to you know, deal with any of that. Um, but all of that is still so unknown. So it's really difficult, I think, for some to get into the AI space because they're just so worried or they don't know where to start because they don't want to step into a pitfall. So what are some of the um, tips and tricks that you would maybe suggest to folks that are in that situation? 
so first is we've already talked about it always start with a problem rather than yeah. trying to start with um with the technology the other one that is big is start small experiment mm. right um people think that the window of opportunity is very small but that's not really the case ai is going to be a part of our life moving forward it's not going away mm-hmm. you know it's part of the fourth industrial revolution mm-hmm. so there's no rush per se there's not a wave that you have to ride mm-hmm. and it's better to even if you want to be early adopter be pragmatic about it and Uh, and i bring this up actually because so many times people would say to me oh no 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 we don't worry need to worry about ethics or responsible ai because our mm. cyber security mm. right now because we're starting so small it's just a chatbot that we are using and i have to remind them and tell them <laughs> it doesn't matter how um, how small or large your implementation is around ai you have to always think about these things absolutely that's another piece that's important educate yourself on ai mm-hmm. it's an evolving field things are changing very quickly nobody is an expert mm-hmm. you really have to start thinking about how you are going to make friends with ai and work with ai <laughs> right um and that threat piece i do want to address because yes it's real there's going to be some parts of your jobs that are not going to be there as as you move forward in this new era just mm-hmm. like um you know there used to be there was no role as a podcast ho- host role <laughs> 20 years ago but now yeah. there is right yeah. um so you really have to start thinking about the human ai connect mm. and how human ai collaboration and how your job is going to evolve you're not going to be able to be successful in that unless you understand how ai works yeah and how, how you can bring in your power skills like creative yeah. thinking like problem solving like effective yeah. communication um like um empathetic leadership into the mix yeah. and that's what becomes important so everybody's job is going to change i remember 20 years ago when i started in this field my job was completely different today there are certain elements of those jobs that i don't even do anymore i don't yep. have to make in excel sheets and write formulas yep. in the back end yep that's all taken care of for me so and that has removed the mundane which i really appreciate but there were people who in my team whose job was to just do that piece and that job does not exist today yeah so we have to be prepared for that and start yeah. thinking about that well and you know going back to our <laughs> the earlier point of you know like the the dock working thing going on dock workers thing going on like i think that that it that's a good um example as was the um uh, filmmaker strike and some of these other industry wide wait a minute not i mean there was a lot of other complications with those but one of the things that's a theme is we needed to address how ai is going to be allowed to be used in my space and i think that most leaders should probably sit down with their stakeholders with their leadership team and figure out you know as much as they possibly can if ai was going to be introduced to these roles that are largely mundane and you know however you want to define that um what are the skills of those folks that are still needed and where can we boost it and where can we grow them out and if you can lay out that plan for your staff they will be much more um they will be less sensitive to the ai topic first of all um but it's also showing that you are an empathetic leader you know it's going to affect their jobs now i understand where you're coming from you're saying like take ownership of your own career and i fully agree with that but i also feel like i see too many companies and organiz- like giant organizations that are just you know letting it grow organically and sometimes that's by necessity but it's also like well now you have these swaths of folks that you work with or that work for you that no longer know where their place is and yeah, yeah it's again up to them to also take ownership of their career and figure some of that out themselves mm-hmm. but 
if they don't understand where you in your organization or your domain is going, they need help with that, right? So I think there's some like back and forth that needs to happen there. That it's I don't a see shared that. responsibility model. And that's what I believe in, right? It's not just about employees trying to figure out. It's about its moral, corporate, social, business, every sort of responsibility of an organization too to figure out how they're creating career pathways for their employees mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that they are successful with this collaboration. Yeah. Right. Um, I was recently reading on LinkedIn where there was a person who was interviewing for a prominent role in an organization. And for the CEO level interview that this person had, there's a bot that shows up and the bot is interviewing for as a CEO. And for me, that is where AI goes wrong. <laughs> that is exactly where use of AI is wrong at all levels. Mm. Because then you're saying that this bot can be, an, be a CEO and interview you. Mm -hmm. So why is this bot not replacing the CEO then if the, if the bot has all those capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. That is where the replacement aspect doesn't gel well. No. You have to start thinking about, and here is where, you know, don't lose your humanity. Yes. Right? That is what is with our, our combined superpower. And if you take <laughs> away that, then um, then I have to question where the human race is going to yeah. go. Well, and that's, I mean, that's that's going back to your educate yourself on AI, right? AI is a great parrot. Right. It's really good at jumping to conclusions based on probabilities and information that it's presented with and, you know, the checks and balances that come from neural networks and people interacting with things and saying, yes, no, maybe so. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it's it, the AI that we have today is not coming up with things all on its own, completely unprompted. Um, and it's a totally novel idea that's never existed before. I don't. I mean, looking at how it works on the back end, that's not, that's not, I mean, it can mimic that and it can look a whole lot like that, but that's not actually what it's doing. And so, you know, going back to your CEO example, what information did they train that robo CEO on? It was probably information from other CEOs and other leadership positions. And so it was a collaborative model that is just being regurgitated in the words of, you know, a fake CEO. So it's it's understanding that isn't going to replace a CEO because after a while, and this is very important, you know, piece to this whole talk is at some point, if you keep making robots, if you keep making synthetic data, that is what is going to only be available. Yeah. And then that's what gets picked up. And so that's where you really do need the humans to come back the in. The thing is going to be as good as your base is, right? But also coming back to this CEO example, I want to bring up another point, Ashley, which probably would get unnoticed if we don't bring it up. Mm -hmm. Interviewing is a two-way process, right? Yes. As yes. much as somebody on the other side from a company's perspective is interviewing the candidate. And the candidate you. is also mm -hmm. interviewing the company to figure out whether this is the right fit or not. Yeah. So here is a great example of trying to use technology and not thinking about the problem that you're going to solve because the problem is not solved. With this one-way transaction that has happened, um, the the candidate's perspective and their ability to judge the company is completely lost. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And that yeah. is the interview. Unless that, unless that is telling you what the company's like. <laughs> and that talks about the culture of the company. <laughs> yeah. It's obviously not the right fit, right? Yeah. But interview, the word itself, interview means yeah. inter, which is exchange of views. And that whole essence is lost in this um, attempt to leverage technology <laughs> or to be AI first in, in yeah. that scenario. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if you want to experiment with things like that, have at it. I mean, again, make sure that the proper ethics and responsible things are in place. But, you know, I think that there's nothing wrong with going in and, I don't know, making a pretend, you know, CEO robot to see what would that even look like? But you shouldn't keep it 
you know, as is, you should really, you know, focus on, okay, but is this solving a problem? Is this really what we anticipate it to be? Because I think that that A-B testing, because people are so quick to just, oh, we, we got the AI thing out now, and it's so much easier to get AI spun up. So like the chatbot mm-hmm. example you were discussing, there are, are a lot of early examples of people just taking any of the chatbots the commercially uh, available ones and just sticking it on their website and not even thinking about it. They're like, it's just a chat bot. It's fine. It's and not doing that AB testing. And that's where you see, I think there was a, an, a news article about New York city, I think had a chat bot that was like leading tourists to the wrong places or something. And I think there was another one where um, an airline, I think had a chat bot that was giving incorrect answers and things like that. Obviously, we're learning from these experiments, but those were experiments that they just put out to everybody, which is a problem. So we got to be careful about that. We need to make sure that our good um, technical, you know, A-B testing, making sure you're doing your fault analysis, making sure risk assessments, like all of those other things should not be thrown out the window because you can just stick a chatbot on something. (laughs) Yeah. And you you know, actually, where it has been done, right? Let's also talk about some of those places. Yeah, Amazon, have you ever used their customer service? It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Like initial first few stages, if they can solve it, if a, if a bot can solve it for you, great. Mm-hmm. They're very quick in handing off to a real person on the other mm-hmm. side to do that. And that's where it needs to come in, like mm-hmm. understanding where it needs a humanizing, a human touch. Yeah. And then moving on because customer success is all about yeah. building those relationships that trust with your customers. Yeah. And that's the right way to implement it. Yeah. IVRs is such a bad example. Everybody talks about that. But there are companies who have used it successfully where they provide an avenue for people to or live agents to be brought in Mm -hmm. as soon as there are indications of somebody feeling frustrated on the other side because they're not able to get through. And then there are bad implementations where you kept keep pressing that zero and nothing happens, right? You never get to a human voice to talk to. So I think it's more about balance. It's understanding how humans and AI can work together and play together. And, uh, And the companies that are going to be truly um successful in this endeavor is the one are the ones where where they can form that balance or yeah. identify that balance yeah yeah and i think that's important too because you know to the uh, you know fears of of job loss or job change that's where that balance is needed right like hey um you know there are only so many hours in a day and you have so many uh customer service uh, folks, and you probably want to optimize their time. So if you analyze your call logs and you see 90% of people calling in or emailing or whatever are asking to reset their password, they forgot their password, send them the reset password. You don't need a human to tell them that. But if you see a lot of people then starting up like these very complicated issues that they're having and they don't know how to do something, um, Again, that's a, that's that's data analysis. You can maybe make some FAQs, maybe create some AI generated um, training videos and things. Like, there's some cool ways to use AI in these areas yeah. too that are not giving just the answer, right? But then, you know, when you need that human touch, it still comes back in. Yeah. So we're just getting started with the AI. AI is not going away anywhere. It's not yeah. a red, uh, It's not a wave that you have to ride. Mm -hmm. It's going to be here for long term. Educate yourself on AI, understand the implications, but most importantly, keep the focus on your customer. Yes. Keep the focus on what problem are going to are you going to solve for your customer because that's the success formula. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's always been the formula. (laughs) It's just we're a little distracted sometimes. So well, Ashley, I can't wait for our follow-up conversation yes. where you are going to be on my channel talking yes. about knowledge graphs, talking about AI, and talking about what are some of the challenges around data, because data is such a significant piece um, when it comes to being able to truly embark on the AI journey. So I can't wait for you to be on my channel and talk about that stuff. Awesome. And I can't wait to meet your audience as well. <laughs>